Thanks for staying with us. You're still watching Standpoint. We're looking at the one year of the Tinubu administration and what has been achieved, what is left um, in terms of security. We've been speaking with a security and developmental expert, Musa Salman, and a retired United States Army captain and national security and defense strategist, Bish Johnson. Good to have uh, Thanks, both of you, for um, staying with us. Now, let me come to you, Mr. Salman, because we've, we've talked so much about um, that statistics that was reeled out by the Minister of Defense. But he talked about, you know, uh, kidnapping. He talked about number of suspected criminals that have been arrested. And both of you have said, well, it doesn't match the reality on ground. How enormous is this challenge? If we were to assume that what the minister has said is, is the right statistics, and yet, you know, it looks like a needle in a haystack. And what does that say about the enormity of the challenge, you know, in terms of security before this administration? Well, the fact is that uh, there is enormous security challenges. And when you talk about the number of uh, uh, bandits or terrorists eliminated, uh, then you're quick to add the number that are not yet eliminated and are indeed terrorizing um, the populace, uh, whether it's in the northwest, uh, in the northeast, or in the north central, and not to talk of other parts of the country like the southeast and so on. Um, so you find out that Yes, uh, it, there is a, uh, efforts at curtailing numbers based on what the minister says, but the reality is that we still have mass abductions. Um, and if, we, if there are mass abductions and people, that perception of insecurity or communities being displaced, you find out that there is still a long way to go. And this brings me to the fact that uh, we tend to focus more on physical security. That's in terms of uh, what the army can do, what the air force or the military can do in general, or the police and so on. And we forget the very fundamental and vital component of security, which is su human security. Uh, the question of what happens to the incidences of poverty. Are people better, um, are people better remunerated or they are worse off economically? Are there more people falling into the trap of poverty and people losing their jobs? Are people being able to fit themselves? Those are the root causes of insecurity and the issue of good governance. Uh, are people feeling well represented at both national and sub-national levels? Because again, the mistake we do is to focus more on the federal government or at the federal level, forgetting that is a tripartite arrangement where we have state and local governments. The question is that the increased income, for example, by the state and local government through the removal of subsidy and so on and so forth, is it actually reaching down or percolating down to the people? Do they feel empowered? And where, for as long as the incidence of poverty, number of children out of school, who today are kids, but tomorrow are going to be adults of 21, 18, or 21 years that are not equipped for the future and do not have a hope in a better future. They are therefore easily can be recruited. You kill 5,000, for example, as uh, the figures of 4,300, but there are 20,000 that are available for recruitment. So you find out that the output or what has been eliminated is far less than the number that are there to be recruited. So we have to look at those fundamentals in terms of what is happening to the other sectors. Like he said, wholeheartedly, uh, a holistic approach. The economy, are people better off, and so on and so forth. So until we address the issues of representative government or good governance, until we, we, we address the issues of economy and make people more empowered to make certain decisions, until there is hope, and I <laughs> thankfully... The, the agenda or the slogan is renewed hope. Until there's that renewed hope uh, in individuals, you find out that the issue of security um, is going to be one step forward and perhaps 20 steps backwards. Uh, that is the only way we can take a look at it holistically. Now, the kinetic approach or the kinetic efforts by the armed forces or the military and, and security forces should be such that you push uh, the, 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 that's the active fighters, that's either they are insurgents, terrorists, or kidnappers. You push them, eliminate them. But the other aspect, which is the whole of government approach, is such that there should be other people or some other aspects of government that are taking care of the will be, uh, recruited members so that they don't have that incentive to get recruited. 
Uh, you talk about the issue of the judiciary. You talk about every other thing. For example, we've had, and I've discussed this in a different forum, um, uh, the fact that we have surrenders uh, in the Northeast. What happens to them? Uh, are there posts, or when mass atrocities like this are committed, people have been killed and so on and so forth. What happens to those people that committed those atrocities? Do you just bring them back and put them back into the society or create a program and say you have rehabilitated them? And how do you integrate the community itself so that it feels carried along? And so that when those people co uh, come back, there is a kind of complete healing uh, within the community. So all these uh, are things that need to be put in place need to be vigorously uh, and, and pursued. And Mr. Samuel, let me put you on hold uh, there and bring in Bish Johnson. Because you have touched on you know, the point I wanted to raise. People have talked about this idea, because you see, both of you have talked about you know, the economics of, of security. And Bish Johnson spoke about it in terms of you know, at the top level, which is funding. You have talked about it at the bottom level, which is criminality. And of course, there is a relationship. But people are saying, look... Um, even if you wanted to um, fix this problem, that non-kinetic approach doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Where you're giving what seems like amnesty to criminals, you know, or terrorists coming back to the same community where they have killed, or, or you know, families, friends, and family members who still live in that community, but it, it might not sit well with them. How how you know um, feasible is that approach of you know that non-kinetic approach, especially when it comes to giving amnesty to to terrorists? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those who are the proponents of uh, granting amnesty to bandits or kidnappers, you know. Um, but I think um, we can't kill our way out of this problem, right? There are, there are drivers of insecurity. And like my co-panelist pointed out, we have to look at those drivers of insecurity, you know, which borders on people's well-being, you know, the level of unemployment. Um, people's access to health, education, all of all those things. You know, you discover that in countries where there is less insecurity, you discover that those countries have very high um, standard of living. You know, that people do not have that time to make themselves available to get involved in crime. So we can't, kinetic approach alone cannot solve the problem. You have to have a combination of both kinetic and non-kinetic. And when we say non-kinetic, I am not advocating for you to pardon bandits because I don't know for what principle or philosophy that the bandits are doing what they are doing, except for the fact that banditry has become a commercialized criminal um, enterprise in which so many actors are involved, including those in government are involved in, in, in. And so I'm not advocating for you know, amnesty for such people. But we are talking about those who are not there now, who may be there tomorrow. That effort has to be um, stepped up in trying to ensure that those people do not fall into that trap in where they become, um, you know, available to, to be used in banditry and all forms of uh, criminal activity. And the way to do that is to make sure that people's standard of living is improved. You know, that people have access to those basic necessities of life. Because if they don't, the obvious is what we are going to experience, which means they will be available for recruitment into all these nefarious activities that we are seeing in the country. And I think that's the area that he, I believe he was alluding to. Well, let me say this. Look, um, the fundamentals of Nigerian security architecture, for me, has not really been addressed. It's not something that will be addressed in one year. But I am hearing discussions about state policing. Yes, there are concerns about having state police. But if you put having state police and not having a side by side, it's a, it's a discussion that we ought to have. And we can have state police and put measures in, in place that does not allow the governors to use those state police as their own uh, security. You know, um, it can be like their own state INEC, in which every time a governor organizes election, a local government election, only members of his uh, political party wins all the local government areas. We can't allow that to happen with the police because this is a security issue that we are talking about right here. So the fundamentals of our security architecture has to be looked upon. And one of the fundamentals of our security architecture is having very strong and autonomous local government. My colleague mentioned something about local government. 
There are states in this country that local government does not exist. The local governments and the states have pretty much merged themselves together. The governors have suffocated the local government structure. If you go back in history, Nigeria retraces its step back. You will discover that Nigeria began to have these problems of insecurity and governance when we began to toy with the local government structure. The local government structure has to be strong and effective. When I was growing up, there were no many police officers in my locality. Yet, when we go for Children's Day and Independence Day, you see Boy Scouts and Boys Brigade maintaining law and order. Now we have police everywhere, we have military everywhere, yet they can maintain law and order. It's because that local government structure has been destroyed. We have to go back to the drawing table and put in place measures that make local government administrations autonomous and independent and should receive their funding directly from the federal allocation so that the governors don't utilize the funds meant for local government for other things. You have to look at our traditional institutions. Our traditional institutions, our traditional rulers have also been balkanized in some areas. You see what is happening in Kano? The same thing that happened in Kano happened in my home state of Imo, where kingdoms were torn up and divided into what they call autonomous communities. So you have one million traditional rulers, but all of them amount to no traditional ruler. So when we began to toy with those um, structures that maintained that equilibrium in our society, and we distorted that equilibrium, that was when all hell broke loose. So we need to go back to those days when those institutions were strong and look at those things that made those institutions to be strong and put them back in place and allow them to function. A traditional ruler should be able to be held accountable for any breach of law and order within his kingdom or his domain. A local government chairman should also be able to be held accountable for breach of law and order within his or her local government area. But you can't do that now when they are governing local government with sole administrators and the caretaker committees and all that whatnot. So these are some of the things that are contributing to insecurity in the country. You see, there is only much the Minister of Defense can do. There's only much the service chiefs can do. There's only much the national security advisor can do. They, they cannot do magic. The things that they do cannot replace the actual governance. There has to be governance. Governance goes hand in me, hand with Johnson, security. That, that you're speaking more about, you know, that it, it, it has to do more, you know, with the subnational level. And I want to bring in uh, Mr. Selman. Because when you speak to governors about security in their state, the first thing you hear is that, look, um, security, when it comes to security, is on the exclusive list. They have no rights over, you know, over um, police, over military. It's all at the national level. But, you know, they get security vote. And from what he just said, it will also seem as though, that's Bish Johnson just said, you know, what I get is that the drivers of, of insecurity, it also seem as though at that subnational level, um, these governors are contributing when you do not allow the, the local government function as it should function or the traditional rulers function as they should function? Yeah, the fact is that you cannot absolve uh, the subnational levels, especially the governors, completely from this. Uh, they, I mean, when it's, uh, when it's proper, the governors announce to all, everyone uh, that they are the chief executive or the chief security officers of their state. And it's true. Uh, and if you go, uh, so the chief security officer, the problem is that we have militarized security, thinking that uh, it's all about holding guns and other weapons of mass destruction that constitute what security is. But if we broaden the definition and the concept of security and understand that the welfare and the well-being of the people is the most important component of security, then you find out that indeed, Governors are the chief security officers of their state, and the level of governance or misgovernance that they give go a direct way in affecting the level of security in the localities or the state which they govern. For example, when you talk about, and, and he alluded to something like um, the issue of state uh, police, as far as I'm concerned, we already have state police. You can call them in any names and so on, and maybe they are not carrying guns and so on, because, uh, so because we have militarized uh, the issue of security, we feel that anybody that is not carrying gun is not, 
is not contributing to law and order or is not uh, contributing to safety. Now, in every or most of the state, you have the vigilantes, you have uh, some other uh, organizations or some kind of setups which are either voluntary or recruited and so on that are set up by the state governors. And they contribute to the issue of law and order in those states. Now, if the question which you ask is that how well are those setups managed? And that would give you an idea of what a state police would look like. If one, the, are they paid? Are they equipped properly? What is the manner of recruitment? And how, what level of screening do those people undergo to get recruited to those uh, outfits that, that, uh, that function at, at the sub-national levels? Now, if at the state level or at sub-national levels, we are not able to handle those outfits, we are not able sometimes to pay their fees, uh, I mean, their provide welfare, cater for their welfare and so on and so forth. Now we are saying no, uh, the only way that this can function and, or add any value is when we equip them, that's in terms of giving them firearms and, and that's it. Firearms will solve all the problem. It will not solve the problem. In fact, it will compound the problem because here you will have people that are armed not properly trained, perhaps, not properly catered for, and let loose on the populace. So the issue is that the issue of governance at all levels cannot be relegated or cannot be abandoned, and everybody has to take responsibility to the level of the funding or resources that is made available to them. Uh, and this includes local government, if they are available uh, because, uh, or where they are available, and the state governments, because they are available everywhere, all the 36 states government are there, uh, and, and so on. So there, there's much that needs to be done uh, at the, at the sub-national levels to ensure that these funds that are made available by maybe because uh, looking at the improved economy in terms of uh, maybe uh, removal of subsidy and therefore there's increase in allocations and so on, all those funds have to get to the grassroots. They have to get to the people. And until when those problems or those facilities or governance is provided, we'll, be, we'll continue to have uh, those issues like, for example, the issue of ungoverned spaces in the states. It's not the federal government, for example, that uh, create the issue of uh, ungoverned or misgoverned spaces, whereby there is the abdic abdication of responsibilities to ensure that all those spaces that are identified uh, Programs are brought. For example, if you identify that there's a forest that is uh, habited by, or by, by these terrorists and so on, when the military forge that out, what stops other levels of government ensuring that those are turned to farms or some kind of you know, economic or activities are engaged in that place to deny those belligerents uh, the opportunity to reoccupy those places? So until there is this uh, realization by the other levels of government, or all levels of government, to say that this is uh, a problem that, has, that can only be solved in the long run through good governance, through true representation, through empowerment of the people, and not through only bringing people that are uh, able to do only kinetic activities, that's the military, police, and other gun-yielding uh, people. Yes, there's a level to which they can go, uh, to make the environment permissive, to make sure that people can go there to perform. But immediately they take that, the other developmental aspects have to be carried on by other aspects or by other levels of government. And it's only when we have that that uh, we can have a holistic approach to security and in the long run, uh, these problems of insecurity will be solved. All right, so I want to get back to the kinetic approach um, once again. Um, Bish Johnson, in the last one year, what would you say is our success rate in terms of tracking perpetrators, um, illicit finances, monitoring movement? Because we know that some of these kidnappers also use motorcycles. So monitoring their movement, you know, whether by their motorcycles or their cell phones. Well, if you talk about that, uh, within the last one year, there's been a lot of noise. Uh, that's what I call noise about... Um, you know, uh, tracking people and stopping illicit um, movement of uh, funds. Um, 
there has not really been it see for me the end justifies the means um it, it doesn't matter how much we run around if at the end of the day people do not feel safe to be able to go about their normal uh, social economic activities or what you have done amounts to nothing and so until there is that real um, impact on the efforts of government and when i say government i'm not only referring to the government at the center i'm also referring to the various subnational governments because let me tell you, the Nigerian government does not have any territory that it controls in Nigeria. By law, all the land in Nigeria belongs to the state government. The governor is, is the custodian of the land within that state. And so for if you look at the entire Nigeria, the entire territory of Nigeria are being held in trust by the 36 state governors and the minister of FCT. So the federal government does not even have a territory of its own. And when you look at the security situation in the country, most of the insecurity we have in Nigeria is coming from the rural areas. That's where most of those insecurity is happening. And the reason why they are happening mostly in the rural areas. Now, not to say that you will not have one or two insecurity in population centers. They do, but that's once in a while. And whenever it happens, they quickly go in there and they stop it. The reason why you're having this level of insecurity in those rural areas is because there is little or no government presence in those areas. You know, bandits can be operating in a community for hours. It will take a whole hours before the security is alerted and before they could get to those bandits or kidnappers or terrorists. Before they get there, they are done and they are gone. They disappear because there is no government presence in those rural areas. And the presence we are talking about must not be the presence of the federal government because the federal government cannot be everywhere in Nigeria. That was why Nigeria adopted a three-tier government in which there is state and there is local government. The only way for us to cover every part of this country and don't have ungoverned spaces in which terrorists and bandits and kidnappers had converted to their sanctuary is to make sure that all three tiers of government are functioning and functioning effectively. And that includes the local government. Until we do that, we will be beating about the bush. Because Abuja cannot secure every part of Nigeria from Abuja. The states have to play their role. The local governments have to play their role. The founders of this nation were brilliant enough, wise enough, to determine that, look, we cannot just have one tier of government. We must have all three tiers of government. Unfortunately, we, as a result of our greed, have destroyed the last tier, the, 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 the third tier of the government, which is the tier that is closest, closest to the people. When I was growing up, I had no business going to Owerri. No business. Absolutely no business. Because every services that we needed were provided by my local government. They maintain the roads, they maintain the markets, they were responsible for the administration of the schools, they did provided water, they provided governance. There can't be security without governance. This idea that somehow Nigeria is going to kill herself out of the problem, uh, kill herself out of the problem by eliminating every criminal is not going to happen because they can never achieve that. You kill 10 criminals today, if there is no governance, you are going to have 20, 30 more criminals tomorrow. So the only way is to ensure governance. All right. So that if you I kill 10 today, tomorrow um, there will be no... Apologies for botting, and I have less than two minutes. I just want to give, um, I want to give Salman another one minute to just also make his final point um, in terms of the direction you think that this administration should go. Um, in the next one year or in the, in the next three years in the life of this um, administration? Just one minute. So uh, my take is that uh, the government should just look at what it promised in its um, manifesto when it was uh, during campaigns and at the, um, uh, uh, at the inception. They are well thought out and, and they were very well articulated. And if only those points uh, are going to be holistically uh, 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 pushed or 
implemented, then in terms of uh, security, there's going to be improvement. Lastly, also, uh, that uh, other tiers of government or at the sub-national levels have to live up to their responsibility and to know that it's only good governance at all levels of government that will save us from the issue of insecurity that we find ourselves in the long run. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, security and developmental expert Musa Salman and retired United States Army Captain, National Security and Defense Strategist, Fish Johnson. Both of you joined us from Abuja studio. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having us.